And that's what we need to think of. I want to bring some good memories. It may be bad memories to some of you. I want to talk about traveling a little bit. And I want to talk about traveling today. We're going to talk about highways. All right. And I'm not talking about Dickinson Avenue and these places that bump us out of our seat when we're driving around. I'm talking about a better highway and a highway that's actually talked about in Scripture. But before I get into that, I want to ask you, how many of you have been around here long enough that you remember when it used to take about an hour and 45 minutes to get to Raleigh? You know, you remember what I'm talking about now. If you still ride with Mr. Jennings today, it will take you an hour and 45 minutes to get to Raleigh. And that's using the bypasses. But, uh, you know, it used to be that we didn't have these bypasses around Wilson and around Zebulon and Nightdale. I remember the days of getting in the back of my mama's Ford Thunderbird had a 351 cleaver in that thing. And you had a back seat big enough that was probably about the size of some of our living rooms now. But anyway, we would start in this car and you'd get to Farville and you'd get on 264 alternate. You'd go by 264 Fish Fry and through all these little towns you would finally make it to Wilson. Well, you know, I remember as I graduated graduated high school and started in college at Wilson Tech, enough of 264 had been started to be able to get us from here right up to the Wilson turnoff. It was 55 miles an hour, but it was a four lane. We thought we had something, you know, to get us somewhere. And then you went through that long, long traffic of going through Wilson. And then you would get to Nightdale. And if you didn't get a ticket, you were lucky. <laughs> Exactly, all kinds of delays and things that would come. But you know what I'm talking about. But now, today, we've got a bypass around Wilson. You can zip and be on it. I can be on I-95 in 24 minutes from right where we stand. Isn't that something? Now, I'm going to let you calculate whether that, <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm going to let you figure that out. But I promise you, I can. <laughs> all right? With that being said, we can get around Nightdale. In an instant, we can be on 440 in less than an hour now, heading north or south and moving. You know, how many of you like to go on vacation? I like vacation. I'm hoping to get one every now and then. But you know, on vacation, we do all this preparation for vacation. We're thinking about how great vacation's going to be for us, and we can't wait to get there. You know what happens after we get there? We can't wait to get back home. <laughs> You don't enjoy the journey in between to get there. And the truth is, the journey is just as important as what it is the destination and where we're going. I want you to think about that. Um, you know, so many times in our lives, we have things that bring us down. We have things that just are a challenge to us. We have sickness. We, we have family issues, we have job issues, we have friend issues, we have all kinds of things. We have health issues, all kinds of things that at time, they just kind of knock us sideways a little bit. But I want to tell you that Scripture talks about a particular highway. It's called a highway to holiness, and this highway brings nothing but joy. And so even in the times when we feel like that we're in the down and in the low, we need to understand that there are promises of joy awaiting us. And we need to hold those true. I want to read to you out of the Old Testament today. We're going to go to the book of Isaiah chapter 35. Now in Isaiah chapter 34, there's a prophecy kind of of judgment time coming into place. Judgment time and pre-tribulation up until the end of the tribulation time. And then in, in chapter 35, we start getting some promises. And I want you to read along with me, if you would, Isaiah chapter 35, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read through the chapter. It says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon uh, shall be given unto it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, even God with a recompense, and He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for the wilderness shall waters break out 
and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, those fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I don't know about you, but I look forward to a day that sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen? Amen. That there's a day of nothing but joy and no pains and no sorrows. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for this time, Lord, that we're able to open up your word. And God, I just ask you the message that is prepared today, not be my message, Lord, but yours. May you use me as your vessel, and may you speak through me what you want heard today. And God, may there be power, your power, the power of your spirit, not only in your word, but in the message that is proclaimed. And God, may it meet each and every one of us exactly where we are. May it be exactly what we need in this stage, this area of our life. It is the living Word of God because it lives exactly where we do. And God, I just ask if it's conviction that hits us that we be convicted and we respond accordingly. Lord, if it's encouragement, may we be encouraged. If it is direction, may we take that direction and use it for your honor and your glory. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as I talked about highways, you know what's not on the bypass? At least as we go around Wilson, the Wilson Donut Shop is not on the bypass. You know what else is not on the bypass as we go around? And some might would say traffic and all other kinds of things, but there's no gas station on the bypass. I can tell you that personally, right? You know what else is not on the bypass? These beautiful hundred-year trees that just go right over the old way that you would go through and see God's beauty in the town as you would go through. You know, sometimes in life, we just want to get to the destination. We just want to be to the end of that peace, that joy that I just talked about. Wouldn't it be great if that's all it was? But you know, God has designed that we don't get to just go to the end. There's a destination. There is a traveling going on, and he didn't ask us to get on the bypass and to get to the very end. He's got us living exactly where we are. And you know, the truth is, if we are saved, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have, uh, we have a faith, we have a hope in what God has promised us in Scripture, right? But you know, sometimes with life we get beat down and we lose not our faith, but we lose our hope. We just wonder, has God left me? And even though we may have been strong in our faith at one time, and in the hope of God always being around us, it is in those times that the devil jumps on us and makes us weak and makes us start to doubt. Is our hope real? Do I have any hope? And you see, it's times like that that Scripture will remind us where God says, I shall never leave you or never forsake you. And we need those reminders, but you know, on our own sometimes we don't think about those reminders. I want you to really look with me in Isaiah 35. Get the picture that is being said in verse 1 and 2. He says, Before there is the wilderness and the solitary place, it shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. He gives a picture of two places that are dark, that are hot, that are barren, that have no life. Nobody wants to be there. And it says there's a day coming where they're going to blossom as a rose. That just gives us a thought and understanding that there is something great to hope for. So how is it that we as Christians help bring others to the highway of joy that is talked about at the end of this chapter? It starts at verse number 3. It says, Strengthen ye the weak hands, 
and confirm the feeble knees. You know, I've been doing some construction work for some family, and uh, I love doing construction work. I absolutely love it. I mean, it is therapeutic to me to just take a hammer and beat something to death with it, you know. No, I'm kidding. Usually my fingers as I'm doing that. I'm teaching Carr how to swing a hammer right now, how to really swing a hammer. And uh, his fingers are feeling that because, you know, you can't just get up there and tap like a little baby. You got to go and hold that thing, you know, hit it. And uh, sometimes he's finding his thumb, which keeps getting bigger and bigger. But anyway, what we're doing right now is some vinyl siding work. And uh, in that, you know, we're cutting and doing all kinds of things. And if you know what I'm talking about, I'm taking a pair of hand shears and I'm cutting through plastic and metal and, and some other things. And by the end of me working, you know, I'm starting to find out I'm, I'm just not 21 anymore. I must be at least 22 now. <laughs> My hands have started to hurt each day that I'm doing that. You know, and, uh, you know, I just find it in my palms right in here that it's like I'm getting tired of, of squeezing those things there. And my fingers are starting. You know, I think that's what they call Arthur, right? <laughs> you know, I'm starting to have this little pain that comes in my fingers. And some of you are like, you ain't seen nothing yet, boy. <laughs> You're still a babe. You just wait. Right? I understand that. But I'm saying I can see a difference. And I use that example because as I was cutting a, a piece just yesterday, I was getting tired and, and I was at that last thing and then them shears just did not want to go through this group of plastic that I was cutting of vinyl. And I was just thinking if I could just get Carl to come wrap his hands around my hands and squeeze this thing, it would go through. But I didn't want him to do it because he's, he's not exactly tender uh, in his steps and things going. But that's exactly what this verse says. Look at it. It says, strengthen ye the weak hands. That's how we as Christians should be leading someone else to God's highway to joy. You see, there's times that we can be very strong ourselves. Our hands may be strong in every way, but the person beside us, their hands may be tired and trembling. How is it we lead them to the highway of joy? We come and put our hands around theirs, and we strengthen those weakened hands. The second thing it says as we look at this is confirm the feeble knees. Have you ever been so tired that you've been standing so long or working so long that your legs just feel like they're about to buckle? You know, back in my, my old days of uh, working on the line in emergency services and things, we'd have long standbys and we would look for that person that was getting really tired and we'd go give them a little bump right in the back of the knee. Because you know what would happen if they were tired enough? They would fall all the way to the ground. That's not what this verse says, by the way. <laughs> it says, confirm to strengthen to build up weary knees. You know, again, that's a call for the Christian. What is it we're to be doing for those around us is to be looking for times that their hands are weak, their knees are weak, and we need to go and build up and strengthen them. That's how we're going to send them to receive the highway of joy, to be reminded of the hope that Scripture talks about. The next verse says this, say to them in verse 4, that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Why? It explains the answer. Your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, and He will come and save you. You see, God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. You know, the problem is sometimes that we're so busy in our lives, we don't look people in the eye. You know, I have found it's a problem, especially for our millennial generation, our younger millennial generation, to have a conversation where you look directly in their eyes. It drives them crazy. It's like, this is too personal. Try it with your kids and see, see what happens. I mean, seriously, they're going to be looking away. They're going to be looking somewhere else. Let me tell you this. If you don't take the time in the conversations you're having with people to slow down enough and look inside of their eyes, you don't know where they are. But I'll tell you this, their eyes will tell you where they are. Amen. And people that walk around and say everything is okay, when you look in their eyes, you see them yelling for help. You see, but it takes time to do that. It takes time. And it takes a caring attitude that that we are to have as Christians. 
You see, you've heard me say over and over and again that I want our church to be the center of this community, to be something special, not some other volunteer group, not something that just does a handout or helps in this way and just does nice things, but that we are the center of community, people pointing people to the one thing that is real, the one hope being in God. And this is exactly how we get them there. We take time to see when they have weak hands. We take time to see when their knees are feeble. We take time when we see that they are fearful and say, Oh no, not my God. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You see, that's what we can do to point people to the highway of hope. But there's something much greater even than us. Start with me in the next verse. It says, in verse 5, this is what God can do. It says in verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. You see, God can do miracles, can He? God is still today in the miracle business. Sometimes people say, well, that was just of the Bible times. We don't have that anymore. I don't know what God you serve and where your eyes are open or shut, but I will tell you today that our God can and still does miracles. Amen? Amen. And so he says this, The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. All of the things that we consider bad will become good. There is a day that that's going to happen, and that day can be today. That is the hope and the joy that we have in God our Father. How can we at times get so caught up on ourselves, I'm stepping on my toes, that we don't just soak in the joy of God, that He loves us so much that He gave His only begotten Son, that He loves us so much when we turn our backs to Him that He's still standing there to put His arms around us, that when all else fails and we finally remember to call upon Him, He says, I've been wondering when you look for me. God will never leave us and never forsake us. You see, there's things we can do, and that's helping strengthen and point people to let them understand of the joy of God. And there's some things only God can do, but we cannot lose hope that God can and that He will. You know, it's interesting, a change happens in verse 7. From 6 and 7, it goes from miracles that God can do with people to a change that's actually going to happen on the earth. Well, some people say, first of all, you're talking about a God. You want me to have hope in a God that I don't see. You tell me He's here, but I see Christians suffering. I see Christians who say do this, and they do something exactly opposite. I see all kinds of things, and I'm told to study this or follow this, and I don't understand what truth is. Where is your God if He's such a loving God when my aunt has died of cancer, when my dad and mom have had a divorce, when this is going on, when all of these things? Where is your God, the God of love, in those things? How can you explain that to me? You know, most people don't want to hear it, but it's very simple. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow at thy conception, and sorrow, and thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be of thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return into the ground for out of it was thou taken for durst thou art and until durst shalt thou return because of sin entering this world there is destruction decay and there is death God didn't want that but he loved us so much he gave us choice and because sin of this world we are all in constant decay the very creation itself screams out and groans for the Creator's return. In the book of Romans, one of my, I have a lot of favorites, one of my favorite chapters, Romans chapter 8, it says this starting at verse 18. Paul talks, 
He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subject the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creature Creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The very trees, the grass outside scream. They can't wait for the Creator to return. You ever got that briar right up under your fingernail? <laughs> That's a gift of the devil. But you see, there's going to be a day where just as we will no longer be blind... We will no longer be deaf. We will no longer have sickness. We will no longer have this challenge and that challenge in our life. It's all going to be gone. Just like creation itself is going to be reset. So how do we answer when somebody says, you want me to have hope in a God I don't see? Why is there this pain and suffering? God has made it very clear. Because of sin, this is what we have. But... There's still hope. There's still hope. Read along with me further as we go further in Isaiah 35. He says, starting at verse number 8, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Now, I want you to understand the analogy of highway being used here. It wasn't about 264 in Wilson. But a highway in biblical times was a great masterpiece. It was something very much needed. Now, they didn't have Corvettes to run up and down it, but just a highway that would stand. It took great, great labor to put this highway in place. It was a place of stability and understanding. This is a place I can pass, and it's going to be okay. And so God has laid out a highway for us of, of great structure. It cannot have potholes in it. In fact, it's described here, and there's a highway that's going to be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. The unclean aren't going to be allowed on it. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. You know... There's times we think of holiness and we think that we're just not good enough to be holy and we're always going to fail. But it's where we put our trust and our faith. He goes on in verse 9, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereupon. It's going to be a highway of safety. It says it shall, uh, next it goes on, it says, It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. You know, in putting all this together, if I just may speak personally and to the heart, I know most of you personally. We've had talks about your faith. I know what you believe or what you tell me you believe and where you struggle. I know the things that are happening in life. And it's not for every one of you, but most of you in here that will share I know. And I don't doubt for a minute your belief in a God, a real God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and died. I know you believe in that. But you know, there's times when I'm talking to you when I'm looking in your eyes, that I see that you've lost something. And sometimes I fear what you've lost is hope. You still have faith, but you've lost hope that God really is still beside you. Even though you know what it says in Scripture, even though you know what other Christian brothers and sisters tell you over and over, there's just this time that we get beat down and we're weakened to the point where that doubt starts to come. And if we're not careful, we lose a little hope. And I'm telling you, as this chapter ends talking about a joy of God, joy is forever and it's unconditional. That even in the worst tragedy that's happening in our life, I can still be at peace and joy because I know God would never leave me and forsake me. How is it I can have that peace and that understanding? Is complete faith, trust, 
and hope in the Word. But you know, I'll tell you this, I've seen some of our strongest, some of the strongest, be broken. And you know, it's at those times when we have that doubt, that, that hope starts to fade away, that we need our brothers and sisters in Christ to come right beside us and to strengthen our hands. We need to be reminded of the promises of Scripture. We need to be reminded that I'm not strong on my own, but us together understand and remember what God has promised in Scripture, that there is joy promised, His joy. We need to be reminded of that. And that's Christians who understand the promise. Just outside these doors is a world that is trying to find fulfillment in everything but God. And they're broken and they're hurt. You know what they need? They need to be pointed to the highway of holiness. I ask you this. At the end of Romans, Romans 8, 28, Shannon, there's a promise that uh, Paul says from the Lord. And I want to ask you how much do you really believe on this. It says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Do you believe that? Do you believe all things work together for good? You know, sometimes people will mis mistake this, misquote it, and think, well, so the bad that happens in my life, that's from God? No, God doesn't give you misery. We can handle that all on our own. <laughs> we can invite plenty of misery in our life. God does know the decisions you will make. And He's already at work around every one of those choices. Every ounce of tragedy that comes around you and your family, God is already at work. The promise here is this, that if we continue to be in the love with God, it says all things will work together for good. God will do an amazing thing. I want you to go back as I close on my highway analogy. You know, right now, they're building the bypass that will get us from here to Aden, in about six minutes. It takes me about 22 minutes to get there right now. And we're thinking of all the time this bypass is going to save us, but it's really not. You're just banking that time in now. Every time you get stopped as they're building this road right now, you're really not saving any time. You're just spending a lot of extra time now. But think of this bypass, what's going to happen when it comes into play. I will be able to leave my house and get on 264 and be in Aiden in six minutes. What will I have missed? How many families that I know that live in between here and there will I have missed? You know, how many places like what used to be the Bull High House that I could tell my kids about as I would go a back way, how many of those stories will we not be able to tell? Yes, it's going to make us faster. We're going to be able to get somewhere faster so we can get even further behind in the things that we plan. But you know, sometimes maybe we just need to take the long way. The hard way. Sometimes we just need to live life and understand that, you know what, this traffic that we're in, there may be a good reason we're in it. You know, this difficulty I'm having over here, this aggravation, these people that are in my way, <laughs> maybe they're there for a reason. You know, maybe each person that God puts in front of you is there for a reason. So many times we're focused to get around, get out of my way, and let me go. I'm going to ask you as our church members this. As you go through the rest of your day and this week, would you first of all remember the promise that God says His joy will be with us forever, and do not lose sight of that hope. Secondly, as you come in contact with anybody and everybody, look into their eyes, spend a second with them. Talk to them. You can tell. The Spirit will discern you if you will give it just a little bit of time. And when you see those pains, ask them about it. Just say, can I pray with you? Be the person who can strengthen their weakened hands. Be the person who can confirm and build up their weakened knees. Be the person that can tell them, do not fear because God is here. Do that. Put them on a path that looks for the same hope that you have. 
and then be amazed, look back at ways that you see God actually changing things. Where He takes the deaf and they can now hear. Where He takes the blind and they can now see. Where you see somebody who was in so much distress, you don't know how they could have got out, but by God's hand somehow they did. You know how the world calls that? Boy, I was lucky. No, God just did something great for you. Let us see it and confirm for Him what it is. And as we go through this life, may we understand that that joy is at the end of His highway. And that's the highway I want to be on, the highway to holiness. Not that I'm going to be perfect or self-righteous or hold my nose up. I just want to love people because God loved me when I don't deserve it, unconditionally. That's the love we're to have as others. This church is going to be the center of this community. You're part of this church. I promise you, both inside these doors and outside these doors, people need to see real, genuine love. That equates to time. That equates to heartache. <laughs> it's not easy. It's difficult. But you know, when we find ourselves doubting whether I can do that or not, I just think back to all the things I've ever done against God and how 1 John tells me that God is love and He's always right there saying, come here, dummy. You did it again. That's the message our world needs. Will you be a part of that message? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you now and I just thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you for your grace, your long-suffering. And God, I thank you that you chose each and every one of us to do something for your purpose. You made us individually and wonderfully made. And God, I just cannot thank you enough for just taking me broken and useless, Lord, and putting me to work for you. And God, I know this church is full of those individuals. There's people listening abroad, Lord, that are just waiting, Lord, and understanding that they, they just need to be on fire more and more for you. That we need to make this life less and less about ourselves and more and more about what you've called us to do. That even in our jobs, our regular life, our families, our places, and all of those places, God, I can be your servant and I can be your witness. And so God, let us understand the promises your scripture gives us clearly. And with that understanding, Lord, may we look for those opportunities where we can strengthen weakened hands, where we can confirm feeble knees, where we can look at those who are in fear and bring them comfort from your word and your strength. And God, may we then understand to just turn it over to you and watch your miracles come true over and over again. And God, may we together get on the highway to holiness the highway that promises not happiness, God, but joy, joy everlasting, your joy and your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.